I'm Tommy Waldrop. Welcome to Mayfield's First United Methodist Church. Tyler, don't worry about it. 50% is about what I bat. <laughs> and you know your friend Jet is not going to let you forget that for a long time. <laughs> it's okay. Thanks for all the years both of you have served as our, yes. as our acolytes. Thank you so much. <laughs> They're like the deans of the acolytes now. <laughs> I'm expecting you to pass it on to others. We're glad you're here, and thank you for selecting our worship service to be with us this morning. A lot of lots of bright, shiny faces. I guess school year being back in place has uh, put a lot of people in the right place at the right time. Lots of special things in the today's bulletin to circle and underline and pray for and participate in. We won't reiterate all of them, but there are a couple of things that bear mentioning. Number one is today is Safe Sanctuary training. Safe sanctuary, you've probably heard, but if you've never heard it defined, it is the sort of all-encompassing term that we use to identify the commitment that this body of Christ, that this congregation has to making double sure, triple sure, that all of our children and youth are safe and that are treated safely. All the policies and procedures and even the physical changes that we've made here to make sure that our children are safe is defined as safe, safe sanctuary. That training occurs once a year. That training is today, just after service. That training is required every year, even if you took it last year or the year before. That training is required each year. So if you work with children or youth, or if you hope to work with children and youth, uh, we'd love to have you with us today, just after service. If not, please set up with Kristen when you can have your own special training session. The second thing they would like to emphasize is uh, July 6th through the 13th of 2019, Jamaica 2019. If you are hearing God's call into the foreign mission field, you've got a week to study it and taste it. We have selected the week of July 6th through the, 9th, 6th through the uh, 13th of July specifically and intentionally because it coincides with the dead period, which is what the period that the Kentucky High School Athletic Association precludes direct contact between high school athletes and their coaches. So we have no ball practices to uh, contend with or compete with. Um, we're having a meeting to talk about all of that this Thursday night, six o'clock, right downstairs in the Charlie Ball classroom. No commitments. This is not like a timeshare deal. You won't have to sit through the whole 30 minutes if you don't want to. But we will provide all the information, answer all the questions that you might possibly have. Um, it's a, a special time for many of us. And many of you have said to me, I'd like to think about that next time. Well, next time is July the 6th, 2019. Um, with that, Let's move on to the uh, prayer of welcome, opening prayer, excuse me. All of us together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
As you're finding your seats, let me invite the children to come down for a moment that is just for them, and you adults are welcomed and listen, uh, welcome to listen in on the conversation that we have. We might just learn something together. All right, pop quiz. I want you to tell me if something is safe or risky, okay? Riding, <laughs> riding your bicycle with your helmet on. Safe, safe, okay. Riding your bicycle without your helmet, standing on the seat and wearing a blindfold. Kind of risky. That's not safe. That's a little <laughs> risky. That's a little risky. Don't try that at home. Just kind of riding down the road. But you have, oh yeah. As long as it's got three wheels, you'll probably be okay with that. All right, all right. Petting your dog while his tail is wagging and he's happy to see you. Safe, safe, safe. Petting a strange dog that's about the size of a wolf and he's snarling and growling at you and there's a thorn in his paw and there's a sign on his neck that says I'm going to bite you if you try to pet me safe or risky risky <laughs> safe all dogs are good dogs right yeah yeah so here's the point here's the point I want to make to you sometimes it seems really clear that something is dangerous and it seems really clear that something is safe. But I want to tell you, even with your helmet on, riding a bicycle can be a little bit dangerous. Even when you're petting a happy dog, a dog that you know, sometimes for reasons that we don't always understand, your dog might nip at you, might even bite you. I had a, an incident like that with a dog that I used to have. And I found out later that he wasn't feeling well, and I didn't know it. He had a sore spot, and I was petting on that sore spot right on his leg. So he snapped at me a little bit. Even the safe times seem risky. Well, following after Jesus seems like it's a safe proposition. But every once in a while, when we're Jesus followers, when we follow after Christ, something that we say, something that we do, maybe just something that we believe might make somebody else angry with us. And every once in a while, we're called to go into those risky places to help people. We're called to travel long distances, like Mr. Tommy was talking about, when we go to Jamaica next July. And sometimes traveling can be a little bit dangerous. Going outside of our comfort zone is always a little bit risky. So what we do is we ask for courage from God. I want you to remember this. This is important. Courage is not the absence of fear. Okay? Courage doesn't mean you don't have any fear at all. Courage means that you do what you need to do anyway, in spite of your fear. Can you help me remember that? Because I'm still working on that one myself. Let's do some praying. God, we love you, and we thank you for calling us into ministry, for sending us into the world, even into the places that are a little bit risky. We ask your blessing upon each of the children here. Keep them safe. But Lord, as they grow, teach them what it means to risk for your kingdom. We ask it in the name of the Christ. Amen. Thanks, everybody. You're off to Children's Church now, right? I'll see you later. Excuse me. Good morning. Would you join with me? Stand and join with me, please.
Good morning. Good morning. Pray with me our prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our Psalter is Psalm 84. It's in the hymnal on page 805, your part is in bold. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it thanks, for the doors of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. O Lord of hosts, my ruler and my God, at your altars even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of tears, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength, the God of gods will be seen in Zion. O oh Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O oh God of Jacob. Behold thy shield, O oh God. Look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the for the Lord God is a sun and shield and bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed are those who trust in you. Amen. We continue our worship with the giving and receiving of God's tithes and our gifts. If you are a part of another congregation and you have a tithe covenant with that congregation, they'll be hoping that you'll bring that back with them. So hold on to your tithe today and take that home with you to your home church. If you're a part of the worshiping congregation here and have made covenant to place your tithe here, here's your chance. It's time to exercise the agreement that you made. If you don't have a tithe covenant, you simply would like to put something in the, in the offering plate that will honor God, it is our promise to you that we will use these funds and all other funds to honor God and to build the kingdom of Jesus Christ. 
I also would like to remind you that there are gifts that don't fit into this plate. Gifts of your time and your talents, gifts of your resources, gifts that involve you giving of yourself. As we go through this exercise of the offertory, as we listen to the beautiful music and we give back to God that which God has given to us, would you consider giving of your time and talents to one of the initiatives that God has given to us for the kingdom? Let us pray. And now, O oh Lord, we ask your blessing upon the gift and the giver, that in all things your kingdom might come, that your name might be glorified, and that in all things Jesus Christ might be worshipped and followed. We pray now in his name. Amen.
please be seated. We're going to read the gospel together. John, the sixth chapter, verses 56 through 69. Listen carefully to these words and let these words speak to you today as we seek to follow more closely after Christ Jesus. Only in so far as you eat and drink flesh and blood, the flesh and blood of the Son of Man, do you have life within you. The one who brings a hearty appetite to this eating and drinking has eternal life and will be fit and ready for the final day. My flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. By eating my flesh and drinking my blood, you enter into me and I into you. In the same way that the fully alive Father sent me here and I live because of him, so the one who makes a meal of me lives because of me. This is the bread from heaven. Your ancestors ate bread and later died. Whoever eats this bread will live always. He said these things while teaching in the meeting place in Capernaum. Many among his disciples heard this and said, This is tough teaching, too tough to swallow. Jesus sensed that his disciples were having a hard time with this and said, Does this throw you completely? What would happen if you saw the Son of Man ascending to where he came from? The Spirit can make life. Sheer muscle and willpower don't make anything happen. Every word I've spoken to you is a spirit word, and so it is life-making. But some of you are resisting, refusing to have any part in this. Jesus knew from the start that some weren't going to risk themselves with him. He knew also who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you earlier that no one is capable of coming to me on his own. You get to me only as a gift from the Father. After this, a lot of his disciples left. They no longer wanted to be associated with him. Then Jesus gave the twelve their chance. Do you also want to leave? Peter replied, Master, to whom would we go? You have the words of real life, eternal life. We've already committed ourselves, confident that you are the Holy One of God. Mm. This is the Word of God. For you who are the people of God, thanks be to God. Let us pray. And now, Lord, teach us the meaning of risk. Remind us that our hearts are made courageous by your Spirit. And draw us to yourself that we might be found in your service. Amen. The night was dark and cold. The two men were making their way through the town, along the city streets, and they came to a place where another was seated, his back up against the wall. The first man looked at the second man and said, I think this is the place. And with his toe, with the tip of his shoe, he inscribed an ark in the dirt. The man who was seated on the ground with his back against the wall reached over and described another ark that opposed the first one so that you have an ark and another ark that go like this, roughly the shape of a fish. And when they recognized each other by this sign and counter sign, the three men together went down into a cellar, a rare thing, a place where it was safe away from prying eyes. And there, joined by three others, they read copies of letters that had been written, written by men that they had only heard of but never met. As they read through those letters, they decided that someone should say something. So the oldest among them began to speak the words of life, not only those that were found in the letter, but words of life that recalled the teachings of Jesus Christ. 
After he was finished talking, one of them began to sing very, very quietly, and the others joined in. And as they were singing, the door burst open, and a representative from the government grabbed the two nearest and walked them, frog marched them up the steps out of the cellar. He was passed on the way up by a soldier on the way down, another representative of the government, and they herded all of these men back to jail. As the sun came up and they were brought before a magistrate, they were sentenced to beating. They were flogged. They were whipped. A cat of nine tails was used. Leather straps attached to a wooden stick, a handle, if you will. And within that leather, pieces of metal and bone and glass, shards, had been affixed. And with every lash of the whip, you not only got the lash, but the jerking tear across the skin of your exposed back. All of the men were able to hold on through the torture. And midway through each of their beatings, they were told, all you have to do is relent. Renounce your God. And here is a small altar. And there is a bowl of incense. And if you will just take a pinch of the incense and offer this upon the altar to the genius of Caesar, all will be forgiven. We'll bandage you up. We'll send you on your way. And everything will be fine. All of the men refused to relent. Save one. He couldn't take it. It may have been that the cat of nine tails hit him harder or tore him more deeply or that he was simply more sensitive to pain or maybe his faith wasn't in a good place. We don't know. Maybe he didn't know. But he said, stop, just stop, just stop and I'll do what you ask. And he dragged himself to that altar space and he took a pinch of incense and he flung it at the altar to the genius of Caesar. Which, by the way, doesn't mean that everybody thought that Caesar was such a smart guy. The way the word was used at that time meant that he had been inhabited by divinity and he was himself a god. Well, as the others were released, they went back to their lives, they lent back to their work. And the one who had relented, the one who had said, just stop, the one who had offered the incense to Caesar's genius, he was shunned. He was left out until he made his way through the market to one of his friends whose wounds, like his, were still recovering, still healing. And he said, would you speak a word for me? Would you speak a word in the assembly for me? And let them know how badly I want to still follow after Christ Jesus. Would you let them know that I could have held on if they hadn't hit me that one more time? The man who stood there said, you know, if they'd have hit me one more time, I might have relented too. And he went back to the gathering and he said, listen, you need to understand what that was like. You need to know how painful it was. I thought they were going to kill us all. And then suddenly it was over. But it wasn't over in time for one of us. Will you give him another chance? Will you give him another chance? So instead of the three-year process of becoming a disciple, where you learn at the feet of the elders and you are taught what scripture means and what it says. Instead of going through that process, he was restored to his place within the community. Oh, and by the way, I don't think I mentioned this, they never stopped meeting. They not only knew that their capture was a possibility that very night that I described to you, the one that was so dark and so cold, they went back the next night and the next night, and the next night. 
You see, they knew the risk. And they took the risk. Jesus spoke similar words to the disciples in the passage that we read together. He was trying to impress upon them not how difficult it was to understand this pseudo-cannibalistic maneuver of eating flesh and drinking blood. That wasn't the hard part, boys and girls. It just wasn't. The hard part was that following after Jesus, even in the times of Jesus, could get you killed. It could put an end to your life. Whether you were hauled off by the Sanhedrin for blasphemy, calling someone a God other than God was blasphemy. And though they expected the Messiah, they weren't sure that the Messiah was going to be the Son of God, not the Son of God, for Pete's sake. Following after Jesus was a dangerous thing then. And now? Now Christ is at the heart of who we are. It's something that we look to in the founding documents of our nation. There's some discrepancy about whether or not it's implicit or explicit, but folks, it's there. It's part of the culture. It's part of who this young nation was and who it was becoming. And although there was enlightenment thinking that let everyone know that tolerance and understanding that the way you worship is going to be different from the way we worship, even amongst Christians. And so it was extended to those who were Jewish and those who were of other religions and those who were of no religion whatsoever. We have a safe place, is what I'm trying to say. We live in a nation where no one from the government is going to burst in those doors and start hauling people out into a paddy wagon because of who we are and the one that we worship. It's not going to happen. It's simply not. So we start to think to ourselves, hey, this is a safe place. This is a place where we sit in some ways in positions of power. We are in a safe place. And yet Jesus still calls us to those places of risk. Places where we may not undertake physical risks from the government trying to take us on, throw us in jail and punish us for our beliefs. But because we are called to those who have not yet heard the clarion call of Jesus Christ in their lives. And sometimes, my friends, when you ask people who are set in their ways to change the way that they think, you are running a deep risk. I've been in class with folks who were brought up with a certain understanding of Scripture. And when the objective truth of what the words say, the objective truth of what the culture provided in terms of context was offered to those students without contradicting directly the doctrine that they believed, I could see crestfallen faces around me because their ideas had been challenged. You run the risk every time you read the Bible of being made uncomfortable. You run the risk of finding that something you've held on to for a long time is not as true as you thought that it was. Certainly not as clear cut in its truth as you thought. And when Jesus warned those first disciples, not just the apostles he had called by name, but those who were on the, the fringes of his inner circle, if you will, when he told them what kind of risks they would be undertaking and the difficulty of the word that he would be preaching and the hard time that they would have, what did they do? They left. I've been in congregations as pastor where folks would get angry and they would leave. And it would tear me up. Oh, it would destroy me. And I went to my colleagues and I said, what do I do? I got to go, the 99 and the 1. I've got to go fetch these folks. I got to go bring them back. And they said, before you go, stop beating yourself up. I said, I'm not beating myself. You're beating yourself up. I said, okay, maybe I am, but maybe it was my fault. Maybe I wasn't good enough. Maybe I didn't do what I was supposed to do. Maybe their Sunday school class wasn't what it was supposed to be. 
Stop, Joey, just stop. And we read this passage. We read this passage together. And he said, these folks had Jesus, and they walked away. Sometimes the risk is too great. Sometimes the risk is more than I can reasonably ask of any one of you. And yet I ask anyway, who will go when we are sent? Which of you will stand and say, here I am, send me? I think that we've all been in those services of worship where the person who's up front at the altar call says, come on, it's going to be the greatest thing ever. There's punch and cookies. <laughs> it's like vacation Bible school. We have, we have balloons and there's streamers. And we'll have this celebration. Do you remember Josh McDowell and the celebration youth groups? We did some of that in my youth group. It was awesome. Christianity's a party and we have a good time every time we get together. We're, it's nothing but singing and praising God. Woohoo! That's a bill of goods, folks. And it's not fair to put that on anybody. Christianity's hard. For the first thing, we're asking you to abandon some of the habits that you've held on to for ages. We're asking you to change the way you think about people who are not like you. Hey, we're asking you to change the way you think about people who are like you. We're asking you to change. There's your first risk right there. Well, and then it kind of gets to the advanced stage. We're going to read through some of these scriptures, and we're going to find out that what we think Christianity is isn't always what Christianity is. That's why there's a bajillion denominations out there, because every once in a while, you get to an English word, and it has a meaning that you like better than the original Greek had. He's like, this is what this passage means. <laughs> and off they go. Sometimes it's a safer route. Sometimes it's a more difficult route. It's a different route. What risks are you prepared to take? Christianity's hard. Did I mention that? Following Christ is difficult. Did, I, I know I mentioned that. Did, did I mention that 11 out of 12 of the disciples, the apostles, died in service to Christ? One in betrayal and regret. Died. Well, you're probably thinking, well, okay, who was it? It was John. John lived out his days after his exile in Patmos. He came back to Ephesus and he retired there an old, revered teacher of the gospel. They would bring him in. I've told you this before. They would bring him in on a pallet or they'd carry his chair and they would, they would set him down in the midst of the congregation. John, give us a word. Little children, love one another. And then he would nod off to sleep or they would take him out. That was all he had. He lived his life that way. Remembering that his master died on a cross. Remembering that his friend and adversary, Peter, died on a cross upside down. Remembering that Peter's brother, Andrew, died on a cross, an X-shaped cross. He remembered that Thomas was run through with a spear. He remembered that James was thrown from the top of the temple to his death. He remembered all of them. And he probably asked himself, why am I still alive? And then they would ask him again, John, give us a word. And he would risk himself in the moment of giving that word. He would risk himself in the moment of even being present in the midst of that company where the soldiers could come in and death could be instantaneous. He risked himself an older man with just days left, and he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people around him. Our risk, we risk change, we risk derision, we risk people making fun of us, maybe on social media, we risk people disagreeing with us. Oh no, he's disagreeing with me. What am I gonna do? Folks, that's a hobby for some of us. What are you risking? I'm still working up 
to a risk on July the 6th that's keeping me off the mission fields in Jamaica. I don't like to fly. Not anymore. I was on a plane once that crabbed down the runway sideways. I had a better view of the oncoming tarmac than the pilot did, looking out the side window. It was a lot of wind, and there was a lot of people who were nervous. And the pilot who was riding deadhead three seats in front of me was white knuckling the seat. And I thought to myself, if he's scared, I'm for sure scared. But that's what risk is about. That's the little kid's lesson. Did you hear it? Did you catch it? Courage is not the absence of our fear. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Courage is what we do in spite of that fear. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is what we do in spite of it. Will you teach? Will you lead? Will you go? Will you follow? Will you speak your truth? Will you say your name? Will you offer your story? Will you give your testimony? Will you give of your riches? Will you give of your wealth? Will you take from your own time, your own talents, and make another person's life better? Will you risk it all for this Jesus who has given all for you? Christianity is risk. And it's time for us to stop sitting in our safe places and doing our safe things. And it's time for us to go into the world to make a difference for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ, the one who risked it all. Let us pray. And now, God, we give ourselves to you, reluctantly at times, partially at times, but Lord, by your grace, by your grace, more and more every time. Open our hearts to receive that grace that we might know what it means to follow more closely after Jesus, even when we risk the blood spattered upon our faces as those around us are punished for their faith, even when we risk our own discomfort when we give up our safe space and move into the world where darkness sometimes reigns. Teach us, O oh God, the meaning again of courage. Encourage us by your Spirit, for we ask it in the name, the blessed name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Full disclosure, if you have heard all this and you still know that Jesus asks you to follow, come forward knowing, knowing that you're risking everything. If you've heard something today that makes you want to take what you have been given by God and to give more as a result, to give more of yourself, to let Jesus have his way with your heart, come forward, risk it all. If you're part of another congregation and maybe, maybe they're a little too risky for you and you want to be a part of this one, or maybe they're not risking enough and you're ready to do that and you think it might happen here, come forward. We'll make you a part of the body of Christ that meets here. And we will send you into the dangerous places, but never, ever, ever alone. And finally, if you're just tired of all this safe stuff, where the bad stuff still seems to find you anyway, and you need to come up here and offer some of that difficulty, some of that pain that you've been carrying, why don't you take all of this part of the chancel rail and those who need to make a covenant to give of themselves, why don't you come here? And if you're here by some strange coincidence because you have a baby that would like to be baptized, now's the time to come up as we sing our closing song. But whatever the invitation is that you've heard that you feel the need to receive, hear it now and respond in faith by the grace that God gives to you. Amen. Amen.
plan A was an infant baptism. Plan B is an infant baptism followed by a couple of our friends joining the church. So you might want to make yourselves comfortable. It's going to take just a second to do all of these things. Don't try this at home. I am a trained professional. <laughs> We're about to find out just how trained and how professional I am. The words on the screen are, are ours to say together, to hear individually and to respond to. Look for the bold text, that's yours. But this baptismal liturgy, as we bring this precious child into the arms of faith and entrust him to the community that God has established, this is a high and holy moment. Folks, I'd like you to meet Alexander Josiah Barnett. How you doing, buddy? Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. I'd like to present again Alexander Josiah Barnett for baptism. On behalf of the whole church, I ask the parents and those who have committed themselves to covenant discipleship with him on behalf of the whole church, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? I do. Outstanding. Do you accept the freedom and the power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord? in union with the church which Christ is open to the people of all ages, nations, and races. I do. Will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself and to profess his faith openly and to lead a Christian life? Do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include this young man before you now in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim his good news and live according to the example of Christ. Hmm. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them Let us join together in professing the Christian faith as it is contained in the scriptures of both the Old and the New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Alex was actually just asking me, hey, does that mean the Roman Catholic Church? No, it doesn't. The little c means that it's the <laughs> universal church. So I just wanted to clarify that. See, sometimes you don't know these things, especially when you're very, very small. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and you brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through the water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured by the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. 
He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare Christ's works to the nations, his glory among all the people. Pour out your Holy Spirit now to bless this water and those who receive it, to wash away their sin and to clothe them in righteousness throughout their lives, that dying and being raised with Christ, they may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Mm. Let's gather at the water, shall we? You ready, buddy? Alexander, Josiah, Barnett, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And take a walk with me. Child of blessing, child of promise, baptize with the Spirit's sign. With this water, God has sealed you into love and grace divine. Child of love, our love's expression. Love's creation, love indeed. Fresh from God, refresh our spirits into joy and laughter. Lead. Christ of God, your loving parent, learn to know whose child you are. Grow to laugh and sing and worship. Trust and love God more than. We can go again. We'll go around. <laughs> the Holy Spirit work within you that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be all your days a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now it is our joy to welcome our new brother in Christ. Through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you as a member of the family of Christ. Wow. Members of the household of God, I commend this beautiful, beautiful child to your love and to your care. Do all in your power to increase his faith, confirm his hope, and to perfect him in love. The God of all grace who has called us to eternal glory in Christ establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit that you may live in grace and peace and not smack on mama quite so much. Okay. Amen. Church, give it a better amen than that. Amen. amen. As you guys return to your seats, I want to invite the drains to come forward. Katie and Ryan have been worshiping with us for some time now. They come to us from the Baptist denomination. And so we invite and welcome them into the United Methodist denomination. Will you promise to support the United Methodist Church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Do you promise now with these assembled here to do the same with Mayfield First United Methodist Church? Will you join me in welcoming our two newest members of the congregation? Thanks be to God for your decision. So we'll see if we can get Alex and his family and entourage. That was a great big pile of people, wasn't it? he got a team with him now. If you guys will greet folks at the door so you can go by and say hi to him. And can I encourage you guys to come to this door and let folks say hi to you? 
And in all these things, we know that we give one another the benediction before we leave. The words on the screen are yours to pronounce to the people around you and to take into the world with you as you go out to risk yourselves for Jesus. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Go serve your neighbor, no matter how dangerous it might get, in the name of Jesus.